ruthlessly to survive. An exposed rocky shore, one of the harshest environments on Earth because it's battered constantly by these powerful waves. So for the organisms that live here, and despite the apparent bareness of the place, it's teeming with life, holding on tightly to the rock is number one priority. And that's only the first. If you can withstand exposure to wave action, there's another problem. Exposure to air. This is a two-phase environment, and although all the organisms here are marine. They have to be able to tolerate exposure out of the water. It's certainly life on the edge. For the organisms that can tolerate all the physical stresses here, there's a payoff. There's plenty of food for the animals, and light and mineral nutrients for the algae. Most of these algae, seaweeds that you see around, they couldn't survive in deeper water, particularly if it was muddy or murky. So there's a lot of competition just for living space here, especially in the more sheltered sites, like crevices in rocks and rock pools. It's a very dynamic and a highly structured community. Here at Angle Bay, near Pembroke in Wales, I talked to Robin Crump about the organisms present on this rocky shoreline. This is a very typical sheltered shore inside Milford Haven. You can see the great sweep of brown seaweeds which cover most of the shore, except at the top of the shore in this very unstable region here with the, with the cobbles. You can see the top of the upper shore marked by this um, strand line here of the highest spring tide that's a uh, sea beet there growing above it, the seeds of which are transported by the sea. Uh, here we've got yesterday's high tide. You can see the strand line, and you'll probably find most of the species of seaweed um, down on the shore there have been washed up here in rough weather. Well, oh, they're pebbles, no doubt. Well, let's have a look at some of them. Here we are, you can see now um, Things like egg rack. This is the seaweed with uh, single egg-shaped air bladders, and that helps the plant to float up in the water. There's another one here, which um, much more bladders on the frond. It has bladders in pairs, this one. Uh, you can see there that they're in pairs, and that's bladder rack, Fucus vesiculosus. Uh, somewhere here, there should be a piece of pelvisha, um, the channel rack. Uh, here we are. You can just see, I think, here, if you look, there's a gutter running down the centre of the frond. The edge of the frond is, is curled around so that you have a, a gutter there, like a channel. That's why it's called channel rack. I can't see... Um, uh, yes, now that's um, the Fucus serratus, which uh, has this saw-toothed edge um, to the frond. That's why it's called saw rack or serrated rack. Mm. Um, the other one that we haven't seen here in the seaweed is Fucus spiralis, um, but we'll see that immediately if we just go down the shore here. So we're still on the upper shore here? That's right. Um, and you can see... Oh, it's better to stop running. Um, <laughs> you can see the... Uh, the channel rack here, uh, this is the one we looked at oh, in yeah. the strand line, which has this channel running on the underside mm. and forms a zone at the top of the shore. You can see a band so that it forms a sort of wig over the tops of the rocks. But if you look just a bit further down there, you can see Fucus spiralis. You see the one that we couldn't find in the strand line. And it forms a distinct band along the shore between the channel rack and the egg rack down there, Ascophyllum. So it's you go Pelvisha, like... Spiralis, 
and then Ascophyllum down in the middle shore. But not many signs of, of animals around here, Robin. Are, are they all underneath the seaweed? or? Well, Where some of them are, but then there are species which actually um, live on tops of the stones. Look, here. Oh, You've got yes. the tooth top shell, mother of pearl top shell, which has um, this lovely mother of pearl glistening inside the aperture there. That's an animal which uh, goes right the way down to the Mediterranean and is uh, very resistant to desiccation and actually preferentially lives out on top of the rocks. Mind you, there are quite a lot of species which live under the seaweed and under the stones as well. If we turn over some of these down here, we might find um, something underneath them. This is um, the rough periwinkle, which uh, you can see is very deeply grooved and again is very resistant to desiccation. This species can live here on the upper shore, uh, out of the water for uh, long periods of time if ne necessary. Anything up to two months it will survive out of water. Oh look, there's even a limpet here. A very big one. That's right. Well down here the limpets on the sheltered shore are much bigger than they are on the exposed shore. There are far fewer of them and so there's more food per limpet and so they get to a great size. So now we're getting into the middle shore. That's right, you've got this great mat of Ascophyllum, of egg rack. It gets quite old, this Ascophyllum. Yeah. Oh. Well, let's have a look at one or two of these. Yes, now if you count the bladders, that's it, isn't it? You can get the age because there's one bladder a year. So we've right. got here one, two, three, Grew a lot that year. Four and five. So this one was five years old. That's relatively young. You do, in fact, get them anything up to two and a half metres long and um, up to 13 years old. And this is where the reproductive cells are produced, these little conceptacles on the edges of the frond, which will actually only release the gametes next spring. Next spring and travel hundreds of miles perhaps before they finally settle out and uh, settle as young sporlings on the shore. So what about the animals then on this shore? There must be some, but they're not very obvious. Well, if you look down into this seaweed, you'll find, yes, can you see it? Just about. Right there. That's the flat periwinkle. If you, um, if you look, it's a typical winkle, but it has a flat top to it, and it has this very distinctive olive green colour. You can see it very clearly in my hand, but if you put it back on the weed like that, it disappears. So, in fact, it's camouflaged. Beautifully camouflaged against the sort of predators that live in the middle shore, i.e. birds. You do get yellow ones as well, but they're much more obvious, and they tend to be eaten by things like oyster catchers and gulls. The other sorts of things we can find here are, um, oh look, the crab. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yes, that's sure a good one. This is a big one because we're lower down the shore, generally speaking. These are less resistant, strangely, to desiccation and are therefore much lower down the shore. The other thing I'd expect to find here under the mats of seaweed, yes, here we are, actually attached to the seaweed, that one, is Gibbera umbilicalis, the purple top shell. Now this is related to Monodonta, the mother of pearl top shell you saw at the top of the shell, but this one has uh, quite a distinct green colour and purple stripes and a little umbilicus in the middle of the shell, a hole going up through the centre. This one is not nearly as resistant to desiccation as Monodonta and therefore you find it down on the middle of the shore underneath these mats of seaweed. Hmm. Underneath these seaweeds as well, you do find the two species of barnacle that are very common on this shore. The bigger one of these two is the British barnacle uh, Semibalanus balanoides, which has six plates around the outside and a diamond-shaped opening. Uh, the much smaller one here is Elminius modestus, 
It only has four plates on the outside and comes from Tasmania. It's a relatively recent immigrant, only arrived in Milford Haven in 1961 and came in originally to Southampton Water on the floats of flying boats out of Tasmania just before the Second World War. They then spread around the British coast into Milford Haven in 1961 and up all the way to Scotland by 1980. So now we're coming into the lower shore. This is the lower shore and um, there are still animals here um, that are not so resistant to desiccation as the ones we've seen higher up. Um, on the Fuca serratus here, you can see these lovely little yellow flat periwinkles. Now down here, the majority of them are small and yellow, where you remember they were large and green in the middle shore. And they look very obvious there. They do, but remember that this is underwater most of the time. It's only uncovered for an hour or two a day. And it turns out that the main predators on these animals are fish. They're fish that sit on the bottom and look up through the weed for their food. And because this is translucent, the Fucus serratus, it lets through yellow light against the sun from above. And so the yellow snails are camouflaged and the green ones stand out like a dark shadow. So in fact they are camouflaged, but to predators that are underwater. Very clever. So we're really getting now to the bottom of the lower shore, Robin. That's right, we're down here uh, close to low water springs. In fact, the tide has already just started to turn, as you can see, and so the serratus is now um, submerged and beginning to float up in the water. And it's almost pure fuca serratus here. That's it, and together with a range of animals and, and red seaweeds, which really aren't very tolerant to desiccation at all. Now you, can, you can see, if you look at the way these things are floating, that they are much more at home, actually, under the water. These are all weeds, species of laminaria from the extreme lower shore. And it's underwater that rocky shore animals become active. Barnacles are filter feeders and use their feathery legs. And once a year, they release planktonic larvae, which swim and are carried by currents until they find a bare surface to settle on. For life. Adults make a tasty morsel for predators like this blenny. Limpets also become active once the tide is in. They graze over the rock surface, scraping off young algae and bacteria with their serrated radula, a kind of rough tongue. Shown here speeded up, limpets graze at random around their home site, a place on the rock to which they return as the tide goes out. It often appears as a slight depression, surrounded by encrusting algae, and the limpet fits it like a glove. It's on more exposed shores, like this one at West Angle Bay, that the grazing effects of limpets are most obvious. These ridges at the bottom of the shore here are very interesting because they actually run east-west. So there's a south-facing slope facing the sun, um, which is hot and dry, and so tends to be dominated by limpets and barnacles, which are very resistant to desiccation. Uh, conversely, the other side is north-facing and shaded. If we go over uh, round that way, be careful there, um, you'll see that on the back um, we are actually looking at almost complete cover there by um, red and brown seaweeds because on the north facing side the laminaria for example is coming much higher up the back face. Lots of Pucus serratus and, and a um, variety of red algae as well. That's uh, palmaria, palmata, and then higher up you get things like gigatina, the carrageen. You can see at the bottom of the shore here we have once again this very characteristic uh, Pucus serratus zone dominated by sorac and also by a range of red seaweeds. As we come up in the lower part of the shore, we begin to see the barnacles. Down here, 
they're semibalanous balanoides, very distinctive kite-shaped barnacle that also occurs on sheltered shores. But here it only occurs on the bottom half of the shore with lots of limpets. There's a very large number of limpets here and also things like dog whelks at uh, Nucella. The dog whelk here is a carnivore and actually feeds on barnacles. It drills holes in the barnacles and scrapes out the inside and these again live just here at the bottom of the shore. The puzzle really, Robin, is why there's so few algae on, on the middle shore. Well. Let's go and have a look. Okay. So, here we are in the middle shore, and it's very different from the sheltered shore. No long escaphylum here. What have we got, Robin? This is Fucus vesiculosus linearis, the bladderless bladder rack, which is a form of Fucus vesiculosus, which has evolved into a form which has no air bladders. This presumably is a protection against wave action. This is a very tough, leathery plant with a very strong holdfast attaching it to the rock. And it can be thrashed against the rocks by the waves and not get torn off as ordinary bladder rack would be. It's the only seaweed which lives in this part of the middle shore. Otherwise, as you can see, once again, we have huge numbers of barnacles and limpets. So here we are on the upper shore again, and it's raining, and a Pilvisha zone. Once we get above the main belt of limpets, you can see the limpets now are smaller in number and confined to cracks and crevices, then it's possible for seaweeds to grow again and we get a band of pelvisia at the top of the exposed shore. The other thing we get in great numbers at the top of the shore here is a different species of barnacle. This is Thamelus montagui, which is a kite-shaped barnacle which lives in the Mediterranean as well as here and seems to be very abundant at the top of the shore. So now, Robin, we're right at the top of the shore. In fact, this is the super literal, isn't it? O outside the shore proper and no more seaweeds. We've got nothing here but lichens. That's because it's too dry up here now. There isn't um, enough moisture for either the seaweeds or most of the animals. But the lichens, of course, are very tolerant of desiccation and they can live on bare rock surfaces. They don't need soils. Also, we can actually see a zonation in the lichens here up this rock face, so that by my boot you have the black lichen, Verrucaria mora. There's a black tufted lichen here forming a band through this region, uh, which is Lichina confinis. And then as we go further up the rock surface, a very definite band of orange and yellow lichens. The orange one is Caloplaca, and the yellow one right at the top is Xanthoria parietina. So even above the seaweeds, there is a natural zonation where lichens exploit the rock surfaces beyond the reach of the tides. Here on the nearby island of Skoma, with very exposed shores, you can clearly see bands of black and yellow lichens just above the waterline. From a distance, they look like strips of colored rock, but in close-up, they reveal a remarkable structure a tough mixture of fungus and alga, with coloured cup or disc-like fruiting bodies that produce spores. This symbiotic association is very tough and resistant to desiccation. Now this is rather interesting. You can see here that you've got these little semicircular rows of scratch marks on the surface of the rock. This is where the limpet has scratched its way across the rock with a radular tooth, which is scraping off the film of algae on the surface. What the limpet's doing is moving along and going scratch, 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 up a bit, scratch, 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 making these zigzag trails across the rock. Limpet grazing is a fundamental importance in explaining what you see on the shore in terms of the amount of seaweed 
and the amount of grazers. You might reasonably ask where the limpids are that have made these tracks, and the answer is they're down here on the other side of the rock in the shade where it's damper and out of the full sun. So limpets are voracious herbivores, veritable rabbits of the shore. But algae can recolonize these exposed shores very quickly once grazing pressure is relaxed. In 1974, Robin cleared all the limpets from a small area on this highly exposed rock face, and this is what happened. Within a few weeks, it was covered in green seaweeds. And even when limpets are present, there are places where algae can escape their predators. One of the most important things one has to understand about exposed rocky shores is the fact that they're dominated by limpets and barnacles and there's very little seaweed. And there are two reasons for that. The first is the wave action, of course, will smash up any big brown seaweeds, but also it's due to the intense grazing pressure by limpets. This is beautifully demonstrated in this rock pool here, where you can see that every limpet in the pool has green seaweed growing on its back. The limpets have grazed the seaweed off the main part of the pool, and the only seaweed that survived is on the backs of the limpets because they can't get back there to eat it. So algae can survive and grow even on very exposed shores, provided they are not grazed by limpets. Pollution is one way in which the natural dynamics of the shore are changed to favor algae. Detergents used to clean up after oil spills are more toxic to limpets than algae. So bare rocks rapidly become covered with seaweeds after spraying. Short-lived green algae appear first, and then the perennial brown seaweeds. Only when these have been removed by wave action or died naturally, can limpets re-establish and prevent the growth of new sporlings. So it can take some years before the rocks clear. Limpets can be suppressed naturally too. Here on an exposed shore at Manabir, there are patches of green algae on the rocks and higher up there's this patch of brown seaweed in the middle of an otherwise barren shore. Why are there no limpets here? Well, just above, there are a series of pools where fresh water seeps down over the rocks across this patch of pelvisia. Limpets are much more sensitive to lowered salinity than seaweed spawnings are, and therefore there are low densities of limpets and the seaweeds are able to grow and survive any grazing pressure. This is very important, again, to the understanding of the balance between limpets and seaweeds on the shore. So next time you go down to the seashore, look carefully at this zoned community, a kind of high-rise garden starting with bands of lichen at the top and descending through different seaweed zones down into the sea. And if it's an exposed coast, encrusted with barnacles in the middle shore, remember that it's the limpets, the rabbits of the shore, that are mainly responsible for the bare rocks.